Good evening, and gentlemen. This is a uh, scheduled meeting of the Sunland Select Board. Please call to order at The Sunderland Select Board has been called to order and is ready for the presentation. Oh, I need to 
Bless you. Thank you. 
Let me know if you have questions. Okay, so there's some uh, data here that I provided in the reports and the pie charts. Uh, the points I want to make about this is that the majority of our overall budget goes to direct education and teaching of students. Uh, so that education and leadership category is um, principal's office staff as well as teachers and IAs. You can see really clearly that another, another major chunk of this pie of our expenses is benefits and insurance. Uh, so the educational component is just about 50% benefits and insurance is around 20% and then it breaks down, breaks down from there. Uh, the other important point I think to make as part of the budget presentation, so almost seven million of our $13 million budget is wages and about uh, that's about 52%, and the majority of that, again, goes to educational and teaching staff. So it's almost 71% goes directly to teachers and IAs, anyone that is on um, those contracts that we talked about there. Questions about either of that? Thank you. 
each district in the state has the resources that they need to meet the calculated foundation budget through local property revenue and taxes and state aid. Um, the foundation budget, the thing that I want to point out there that's important is it includes students who reside in our district as well as students, or students who reside here in Goldmark School as well as students who reside here but choose to go to another charter or public school. So kids that are choicing out, we actually receive revenue for those students even though they're going out of district. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the foundation budget is made up of 11, of 11 different categories that the state sets and they set the rates for those categories depending on what age the student is. And that calculation comes out to what they say is our minimum per pupil cost. And if you ever look at the chapter 70 workbook, depending on what district you're in, that number changes. Because the formula is comprised not only of enrollment, there is um, calculations for low income students, there's calculations for um, English language learners, there's calculations for special education, out of district placement, there's a lot of components to that. But ultimately in the end, it sets our per pupil cost. From there, the state looks at the town wealth and determines what the minimum contribution is for each of your town's preservation. And remember, so this happens at uh, your local elementary level as well. Um, <clears throat> so the income is based on property values and personal income of your residents. I'm sorry if this is like something that everybody's heard, but I just want to make sure that people understand because it is really complicated. Um, property values are not necessarily based on your assessments, they're based on the state valuation of homes okay. in your town. So those things may not necessarily correlate, so that's something um, to look into at the town level as well to make sure that they do line up if that's how they're assessing them. Uh, and then the other piece that's even a little bit trickier, and I know that some of our school committee members can attest to this because it has impacted several of our towns in the past, is you could have a handful of really wealthy residents in your town that completely skews your numbers. So it's not necessarily a good thought. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm retired. <laughs> I have no income. How long? Yeah. So, you know, on the town end, I imagine folks are saying, we're not wealthy, you know, we can't afford this, we can't afford for a tiers assessment and the fire department increases and the police department increases and we have the elementary school and our own building is falling apart and the library. You know, there's so many components that you all are managing and at the same time, through chapter 70, the state is saying, this is what you can afford. Um, okay, where do we go from there? So chapter 78 is then calculated, so that's the difference that the state is going to cover towards our foundation budget between what the foundation budget is and the town to pay we then get in chapter 78. So that's our revenue stream for the town to cover what they say is the difference. Any questions before I keep going? Okay. <clears throat> A lot of information. You do great. Thank you. I like that. I love that. <laughs> no, you're good. Really good. Um, so, all of those pieces bring us back to our assessment. So, we know our chapter 78. Um, I want to say that our chapter 78 for uh, four out of five of our towns 
Transportation reimbursement, uh, we heard that the governor may um, be pushing for 90% reimbursement rate for regional schools. Currently, the calculation on the cherry sheet shows a 75% reimbursement, which is typical over the last couple of years. 100% of that reimbursement goes to reduce the assessments to the towns. If by some chance that number grows between now and whenever you're assessed, which it has in the past, um, we would take that money, hold it in a transportation fund, and then credit you in the next possible fiscal year. So that state reimbursement is constantly going back to our four towns uh, for transportation. Our next revenue source for us is excess and efficiency. So the school committee has supported for several years now. I don't know how long it started before me, but at least five years, I believe, uh, to use $200,000 of our free cash to help reduce the assessment. So this year we certified $416,000 in free cash, 200,000 of that will go directly back to the four towns through the assessment funding reduction. <clears throat> the last piece of this is the minimum required contributions, which the state has set here at the 5.5 million, and then I gave you the breakdown there of the four towns. Um, and again, that is based on wealth and enrollment and helps contribute to our assessment pressure. Okay, so our budget, uh, two point, our 12.5 million, we're receiving 8.8 .8 in revenues, including the minimum required contribution. So our budget shortfall that we're moving to fund is $3.7 million. Oh, you spoke up. Yeah. 
question is, uh, how many students are going out of choice and how many are coming in? Approximately? Well, up to 427, right? Because there's no school choice numbers in here. There must be 50, 75, 100 kids of school choice that come. I'm just wondering what the total en enrollment is. Total enrollment in front here is 614. 614. So 20, 4 difference. Okay. Um, plus, we have tuition in students that aren't in that number that pay full tuition to be part of our specialized programs that um, actually tuition like private school. Right. So that, was, that was an option. So, okay, it is. Follow on that stuff. You have a cost per student. A what? Cost dollar per student. <laughs> It's kind of all over the place because I can tell you Franklin Tech is saying our cost a 16636 per pupil. I mean that's what they have put out there. Right, so of the 12.5 million general fund budget based on 614 students, which does include the school choice out, it's 20,500. Which is higher than what the state, I believe the state minimum, I don't have the chapter 71 book in front of me, but I think it was around 15.5 for what the state says is our minimum that we can for people set. Any other questions before we keep going? The uh, church she covered is at this point in time, that's, this is what gets me grateful numbers, but is that correct? Yes. So they say there's 614 kids on the frontier? Correct. And 427 are from the four towns? I think given wow. the current uh, age of the house and, and Senate, you're going to see an increase in the governor of that room where it increases in those. One third of the population. I think you'll see fewer people over 60, you'll see transportation go up. I think there's areas that are going to pass, so when, when one person's scratching, the other person's back in the same part there. So I think you're going to see some of that. Okay. So, on to the assessment. Um, I'm not going to go through each numbers they are are here on the screen what I will tell you is uh, the key factors again that state required minimum contribution we do not control that that is what the state says each town can afford to pay the other two components the operating and the transportation those numbers correlate back to that 3.7 budget shortfall that I described and are based on the town's cost share percentage split uh, so for Conway, we are seeing an increase of almost 45,000, which equates to 2.88%. Deerfield, 231,000 roughly for 5.53%. Sunderland, 191,000 for 9.14%. And we have seen a decrease in their assessment over the prior year of about 100,000. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit on um, a couple of pieces that I've already talked about because we've had some questions come through the office about these various numbers. And what I want to say uh, is that the state minimum requirement is really driven for each of our towns outside of Waitley around the wealth of the town. Um, Deerfield and Sunderland in particular, Conway not as much, uh, but Deerfield and Sunderland, there's enrollment decline if you look at the Chapter 70 workbook, if I'm being perfectly clear about it, that numbers are decreasing from the town resident students that are coming to Frontier, at least in this year's formula. However, your minimum requirement required contribution is up significantly. Mm -hmm. So that is what is contributing primarily to the large so that's like our whole two and a half percent right and there. And we don't control those numbers. We that's the state. have a vote. They're like the opposite here. You must have had a 
Assessed values went up too. Their EQV went up. How did they go down by that much and we went up by that much? That makes no sense at all. The good thing we can tax income. Raise my hand and say this is our third year in a row. Thirty percent. They must. They got must. They must got my salary in there now. That's making why. so much money. Thank you. 
Okay. And then the next piece of the assessment is for the borrowing, which was approved years ago, that $1.8 for the six major projects. I just want to go back to the fact that it's for a project that goes over the big attention where this did a long way is that the school's picking up the other 200,000. We're using school choice money to do that. So we talk about where school choice money goes. It's clearly when you're at the top, it's not going to the towns. On other, on, on, we try to use school choice money on one time items when we can. While we're using around 300,000 offset the budget, if that's thing you want to use it all day every year because it's going to go up and down, then causing greater influx up and down to the towns. We don't want to do this. We want to do kind of one and done projects such as task force. So we're kind of doing one third, two thirds. Two thirds, one third to the, the towns on that. Great, sure. thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. I forget that not everybody has heard the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the last piece of the assessment is borrowing the 1.8 million that was agreed to by the four towns several years ago for the big six projects. So far, we've done uh, the track. There's been some new track work internally. Uh, carpet, this library included. This was all changed out. A lot of flooring in the building. So far, we borrowed 9.3 against, against that, I mean, I'm sorry, 930,000 against the 1.8 million. Um, we are currently in an interest only payment, which is why the assessments are much lower than they will be when this kicks into a, a fixed repayment term. Um, we will have to renew in July. I hope that the rates are in a better spot by then. We are going for a year of interest only, and then we will have to convert this money into some type of fixed repayment plan. You can see the assessment breakdown there. And then I gave you the totals of general fund, capital, and borrowing, whatever it was. So that's that. For school, and school choice brings in a million dollars, around nine hundred thirty-five thousand. So that means school choice brings in approximately eight percent, and yet they're thirty percent of the school population. That doesn't make sense, does it? What am I missing? I mean, the, but that's not that's not them. That's the state, right? The state saying that this is how much you pay per school choice. Well, we're supposed to look at school choice and make it. You're supposed to make it affordable for your town, also. You're just not supposed to. So you can deny if you're in a business. Oh, you can deny. So if you're in a business, right? And you, your product costs six thousand dollars, and you charge three thousand dollars. You're not going to stay in business long. Yeah, but that's why government's not in business. Government does the stuff that you can't make money off. Of. Now, is the school choice money that's what we're getting for the students coming in, or is that a a balance between what's coming in and what's going out for students from the towns leaving? Because if it's the difference then that might account for it, because it might be that 150 students are going out and 180 are coming in. Um, you know, I think that that is, because we pay, they don't pay school choice going out, we do. We do. So the money going to them, okay. Yeah. Okay. They get the money coming in, we pay for the ones going gotcha. out. I didn't know if it was just the difference or whether it was a, okay. That sucks. I think it's both ways. Yeah. <laughs> that we could get the four towns to write a letter um, to our legislative delegation. Do we want to ask that? Mm -hmm. that? Do we want to ask that? Per is pretty uh -huh. like, <laughs> I think it's a question to be asked. Even if we get $60 a student, I mean, we don't even make $37,000. So Can you raise your hand for us? We cover the kind of expenses, increases that we get. So a town like Whiteley, and, um, they had six kids go to Frontier this year. Oh. Okay. 
Columbus school oh, school. You didn't have a class size of six and weight. You know. So you probably had seven, eight, nine so kids' school choice. Yep. Then Frontier is obligated to take those kids. Sunderland, I think Sunderland, we don't know who in your group there, but 
Yep. Yeah, it's unmuted, so. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, the first one I had was about the um, school choice. Uh, unless we're doing our math wrong, it looks like the school choice makes up about a third of the school or 38%-ish. Um, it looks like they're only bringing in about 8% of the budget, um, unless I'm doing my math wrong. Um, is there a uh, reason why that's the case? Is that something that's um, being looked at? Is that something that we can adjust? So, yeah, we do look at... You're going to have to mute your energy. Um, so we do look at... Um, so we do look at... Here we look at school choice grade. We're all at our numbers. is in seventh grade. Seventh and eighth grade. Okay, so... We, get, we have our income in class, and then we see where we are um, and how we roll it out without adding sections. Okay? Now, so, you know, so the, those school choice numbers, and then those numbers are carried through. So if we lose some students along the way, and you know, we've had some kind of ups and downs with COVID, um, we also can lose students to tech um, going into ninth grade year. So that can also cause an inflation in those school choice numbers. Okay? Um, Right now, you know, we are talking about uh, the actual size of Frontier, and we're probably going to see, it. looking at the numbers coming up, we're going to see a decrease, um, probably starting with the current fourth grade class at Frontier. We're seeing a large drop, and then goes up for one year, then it kind of drops again and stays steady lower. So you can see Frontier um, coming down in size. I think it's important when you look at school choice that there's a couple factors. I know we're looking at the finance piece, we're going to talk about the finance side of it, but there is a the other side of it is that we also have to think of school choice going out. Okay, so it's a game that we have to play that's full of um, it's, you know, full of politics, so to speak. Um, where if you want to have substantial programs at your school, okay, we want to round out those classes so that we can have as many offers we have. If we want to do a big budget, such as that's what you're talking about, Karen brought a good question about an outside person coming in to look at what does it look like, um, you know. Looking at the finances of school choice within it and, and long term moving forward. Right now, we've been doing it as we roll up classes, trying not to create new sections. But at the same time, you can lose sections by not having school choice. So if we have over 100 students in school choice, do we have a spring quarter? Do we have, you know, some of the, the programs that, uh, do we have the amount of, you know, athletic offers? Do we have, I mean, people are leaving districts to go find those things. Do we perform musical instead of just, a short, small place. You know what I mean? You know, I say everything gets canceled, but the scale which we do things on, and people will walk to schools that happen. You know, they will go south to schools that happen. We saw that um, when we've seen it in our own districts, um, I say districts being our elementary schools, where there was a reduction of services, people left. And then you're paying out. Now it goes directly to the towns you're paying out. So right now, we are a winner in school choice as opposed to them, because we take in more than it goes out. And we also have to offset charter, okay? And so for charter that goes out, we pay approximately $20,000 per student who chooses a charter school. Yet, if a student chooses us, we only get $5,000. So, you know, you, you know, if you're on the charter world, that's just the reality of it, that we have to take four students in for every one that goes out. Um, and so we, you know, we're looking at that number really too. There are other districts around us that are paying the bill for those students leaving their district before they even start with other so there are millions going on. And that's not fair either, as folks will say that, you know, just because you know, we see that we're on the wing side of the game, we got in the game, and you know, that's where we're at. Um, you know, some people think we should be out of the game doing that. But once you're in kind of playing a game where you know, people are leaving and you're paying the cost, let's take care of that side of it, then we got to play the game and we can take it. So I just kind of want people to understand there's a lot more kind of going into that. Um, we should not be having, you know, Full sections worth of choice students. Um, that's not that's not how we want it to be done. But um, how those numbers get a little bit heavier in some of the class 
County Street. Got no logic in that. I ask you to talk to your school team members that are on the tech team. So, um, I'll, I'll be right Did you have sure. one question? Another question, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, just two, two more things. Um, one, one of those is, do, do you have the number for what money we bring in per school choice child versus the per child cost? You said the per child cost is about 20000 per child. What do we bring in per student for school choice? Just in sum, just in summary, it sounds like the towns are subsidizing eight thousand dollars per student um, for school choice to come in. So I, I do question whether or not our our strategy of trying to attract more school choice students might be healthy for the district in terms of enrollment. But I'm not sure that's healthy in terms of the burden on the towns that are, and in the end of the day, subsidizing eight thousand dollars per student. Um, and you had mentioned earlier that. You know, there's an ebb and flow to the assessments, and they go up and they go down. Um, but this year, 9.14% for us. Last year was 7%, and the year before was 14, which means that Sunderland's looking at 30% in three years. Um, and for context, the $200,000 that our assessment's going up this year is our 2.5% for Prop 2.5. And so that's our entire operating budget increase for this year. And I get that that's largely out of control of your hands because of this the minimum state assessment. Um, I just think it's important that you guys are, are aware, A, how big of a deal this is to our budget, and B, that this is not just our year, this has been our year for three years in a row, um, and that this is going to be a real hard hit for our town to absorb. Um, and obviously, this is maybe soapboxing, but it does raise the question of why the state bases, the in bases this on income when towns can't actually tax income. Um, and if one rich person being in town, the town can't turn around and say, great, give us an extra $100,000 for that person. Um, so I, I do agree that maybe there, there is a letter writing campaign or otherwise action that the, the, the district should take at the state level to make sure that the, the government is aware not only of the unfairness of a lot of this, but of the just completely unacceptable, I mean, for, for just our secondary education to take our entire town's budget let alone our primary education, let alone any of our town services, uh, really is, you know, something the state should be aware of. So I, I echo um, that concern and, and the need for that to be something that we do. Can I respond to the opposite direction on that? Do you guys know, I don't know the answer to this, but some of you do pay the lowest in taxes. My question is, does that have a factor in with the state is assessing you versus the town economy probably six percent more in taxes. Do, does that have any impact? And the lowest, one of the, 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 lowest, the four towns, one of the lowest in Franklin County. Does that have a factor within what they're saying you have to pay versus the revenue you pull in? I don't know how that, the two work together. Can you? 
So I, I would say that given the numbers I'm looking at, it's fair to say that the state is assessing Sunderland's value at a lot higher than it did last year and at a much larger increase than it's in accessing the other three towns increase. Um, so I would imagine that was part of it. Um, if we look at the numbers of what the percentages are for Not the four towns, um, the, the dollar per 100,000 for Sunderland went down because our average assessment went up in town. Um, and so I, I would agree that that's probably part of it. Um, but again, Prop 2.5 doesn't take that into consideration at all. Just because property values in town go up doesn't mean that we can actually collect more taxes beyond that 2.5%. The FERC card report? Uh, of the tax rate with the yeah. average tax bill. The school choice is being, you know, being, is being that bill is, uh, is being supplemented by the, the rest of the towns are paying the difference. So that's a, that's a complicated, it's a complicated way to say it. If I have a classroom in front of me with 12 students and I add three, how much did I just incur cost on the district? Well, you can say, I didn't call any cost. I have to be a teacher. I got to pay for this. Smart for the front of the room. I got to pay for the electricity and the heat. I got to pay for all the insurances. I now create up. I now increase the size of the class, which maybe actually increases the diversity and wealth of the class. Of what's going on in it? You know. So I think it's, a, it's more of a complicated question to just say the number of students you have in. They were paying for these students. They were supplementing that price per per pupil. When it's difficult to say that's the exact cost price per pupil, and that's why they give us that thin increment to make up the difference because that is actually more uh, direct human resources that can be uh, costs that can be uh, uh, can be you know, labeled and marked because you're giving a certain thing under a certain service rate. Um, so I just I think it's, it's a little bit more complicated than just saying that you know we have more students in their choice and that necessarily means that we're paying for that dollar for dollar. But actually you know I would say the opposite um, I think a lot of other Towns in Greg and Canada would rather be in our situation than the situation we are in, unfortunately, due to the fact that we do have a rich school choice population. I, I would add on to that that at the elementary level, or anyone that's on uh, an elementary committee as well, if we're having a lot of students that are having real conscious conversations about the elementary or school choice enrollment at the elementary level and what that impact is to the elementary school and then that trickle effect to frontier. Um, so you're talking about it, we recognize that there are town uh, folks like you as well as residents that see school choice pros and cons, some hate it, some love it, um, and we are having those conversations. Does someone have another question? Do you have to see your hand up? Yes. Uh, Darius, early, this is Tom. Earlier, you made a comment about the uh, the tax rates. The uh, Franklin Regional Council of Government just produced a study that compared tax rates, but also it compared, it looked at overall tax bills. And I would say that Sunderland, Deerfield, Whiteley, Conway are kind of on, although their tax rates may be lower, their average tax bills are pro are all within the top 10 10 towns of Franklin County. So I, I think there's, it's a little more complicated than just saying that your tax rates are low. I think you have to look at the total tax bills that are being generated also. Thank you. And we have somebody, I, I don't see your name up there. Do you have your hand up? Lori. Lori? Sorry, it took a while to get here, Lori. Hi, no problem. I'm um, actually learning a lot every time somebody asks a question and speaks. In fact, one of my questions was answered in the last one, so thank you for that. Um, and I kind of want to echo what Sunderland had said and Carolyn, um, and I think a lot of it, a lot of what we end up with does come back to the state. And I think um, not a lot of people realize that. They don't realize that, the, that you guys are just kind of working with the numbers that we have. So how do we change those numbers? And that's the part that comes from the state. So my question is kind of related to what Carolyn said. Is there any outreach from the administration and or the community to our legislators um, regarding additional funding for our students? I know that um, there was that whole commission that Natalie um, Lay and Adam Hines uh, chaired for the rural districts. And I know that, you know, I know our, um, Representatives are, you know, on board with public 
school funding and especially you know the rural community. Um, but I don't know what um, is being worked on right now with that. And if there's any outreach from us to that, um, I actually have called them in the past week or two and I'm trying to set that up, you know, personally. But um, I think it would be great if you can get anything going with that from the school. And then um, if not, I mean, I can help gather troops in the community. But I do think that that's another component that needs to start happening because everything that we look at this year snowballs for each year. And we're getting Jeff, could you put up the hand, please? Now. Like, uh, this, is, this is the frontier meeting on Thursday. We have the DES meeting, which is going to be really pretty brutal. Um, those, those conversations that we're having because we're looking at cuts, not just level. Um, so I, I think we need to, you know, really start advocating. Like, where else can we get funds from? You know, Washington State. Good question. I did have lunch with uh, Joe Comerford on Friday, and Dan uh, Blay was there as well. I wasn't at my table, but I was at the table. So the uh, uh, Franklin County where the Tiger Valley superintendents uh, set up so that we sit down with our state legislators and talk about that. We have two state legislators that understand the park picnic clearly. Um, in conversations with them, they are filing bills that are pro our situation. The problem is, is that we're Western Mass. And they can only, they do the best they can to get what they can go our direction. One of the things that I asked at the uh, luncheon that we had was consistent rule aid. Our rural aid is going up and down, so we can't use it in our budget year to year because we don't know what we're going to get next year. Or we can. Some schools are and some schools have to. We're reluctant to use it on annual budgets because unlike some things where they say, we'll guarantee you 50% of this next year. So what I asked for is to just give us 50% of the rural aid next year so we can drop that straight to our budget and offset our budget with that. So we can ask that. You know, uh, obviously, we're taking notes of that kind of stuff. That's a, a simple thing, what they're doing now. Uh, they're trying to get us more rural aid, as you saw the rural aid report, those were with uh, that, and finally bills to get more groups into that, and transportation costs as well, uh, to get 100% of the reimbursement of regional transportation, which helps. Um, it's not going to solve the overall problems, but I kind of went to my meeting with them on Friday with, like, what can I really get other than just get rid of the kind of those EVs kind of deal. Um, but we are doing that, and our uh, superintendent group is. Um, Writing letters and doing all that other kind of stuff. So we're doing that with this event. Um, there's other avenues out there. Do, do you see? Do you see a benefit if so? You're doing the what can I actually get as a superintendent, which is exactly what you should be doing. And thank you. Um, but more community involvement and constituents going up and saying, "Hey, we're rattling this cage. Does that help them then go to Boston and rattle that cage?" Yeah. Okay. Joe and the others came on almost the same year. It was one year apart. They learned a lot from us. We did a nice job of communication now because I remember the first year it was, they probably were spinning with the request, and now they approved it. In fact, I sent a note to Joe the other day, and I was wrong. He sent me a note back and said, I think you're wrong in the numbers you presented because I got to complaining about something. Um, I was like, oh, you're right. So like she's that much on top of it where usually. Um, I would say a lot of legislators are a step behind school funding because this is a little complicated. They both uh, should be very knowledgeable and, and are doing us, but I think, you know, doing what they can. That's it, is, it is really complicated, and there's so many um, intricacies. I mean, even I feel frustrated by the lack of some of the funding that we're getting that you mentioned the SOA and the fair share. But the other part of me is like, well, where are those funds going? They're probably school. Do we really need it? Like, I, you know, I get the complexities. Um, I just, I just feel like um, I, I'm, no, I don't want to keep, keep going down the road of like decrease, decrease, decrease instead of like gradually increasing or, or leveling. And I'm just looking for ways that um, we in the community um, can can help or what we can do with that. Um, that's a conversation I can have outside of these administrative meetings also, um, but. I, I hope that people in the community will keep that on the radar. Um, we all need to do something about this. Okay, that wasn't really a question, but. <laughs> thank you, Lori. Okay, gonna, thanks. We got, we got a couple questions in, uh, in the audience, and I'll come back to the screen in a minute. Paul, you first? Yeah. Um, small statement about some of the issues that have just been brought up here. And, as we know, this is the budget meeting. This is about finances. This is about numbers. 
It's all very sterile. Uh, humanity is out of this meeting as we sit here. I, I take the book from the textbook. Well, those guys come around, the superintendent, the businessman, they come around every year. They put a program on. When they're done, you go, humble. Okay, I get it. Their programs, what their programs are doing, what they want to do, what the future looks like, you can't say no. We don't have that. And I strongly suggest that you interject that, whether it's the principal of the school or whether it's the school committee or however you want to put it together, but you put together what the school is doing and the success of the school had, or else that little waterfall down every single year she was just describing is going to continue because the value is not being seen by the general public. Because the general public is watching this. And the numbers are put them to sleep. And all they see is 2%, 3%, you know? This, it, it has nothing to do with humanity in this building. And there is, the humanity here is everywhere. And that's fine. Someone else have a question? Yeah, I have a question about, uh, do, do you know where most of these school choice students come from? Is it the particular town or particular group of towns? Because that would be a, a proper logic for, uh, uh, you know, regionalization discussions to go towards it. So what percentage of, you know, they're all coming from one town, and it's like a significant project that's down students. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have it exactly. Um, just part of the high level, uh, there are instances where some of our neighboring districts in Franklin County don't have the athletics or the arts offering. Some of the smaller schools, Oha, Gil Montague. Um, we do have students coming from those areas. And then I think if you look at it, you also have students coming south from south of us, too. Um, we certainly could. The majority, majority of coming from Greenfield, from my view, I think mean, those are the biggest city in the communities. And then I think there's a splattering of all the rest. And that should be. Some of our are going out as well, various reasons as well. That should be in their finance committee and up there trying to figure out how school choice and paying out millions of dollars in other communities. Anything else? Okay, uh, somebody from Sunderland have another question? Oh, Carol, leave your hand up. Yeah, we have a lot. I, need, I have one more question. Hold on, Sunderland. Carol, why don't you finish? Why don't you... Um, do we have a current OPEP liability figure on offhand? Okay. Um, I, I just think we need to keep that in mind too. Um, and then my other just request, um, following up on the, on the comments, is that um, there is a public hearing on March 13th, and I think we should submit at least some kind of letter from our fourth communities. And if our town administrators could work with um, Darius to put together a letter um, about this lack of funding, because um, rural aid doesn't help us. So what we need is to sort this out. And long term, we have to unite and advocate across the state. But um, I just want to say that us by ourselves isn't going to do much, but we should at least submit some kind of written testimony for Monday, the 13th. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. So, do you have another question? Yeah, Couple. Uh, uh, hi, Darius. This is Joe Elias. I'm on the Finance Committee and also been in education for quite a while. You give that a uh, good example of a class of 12 going to 15. That is helpful. Um, and makes more diversity, but when you get to 25 to 28, now you're talking about a different problem. So that's one statement. 
Um, and I don't know if there's class sizes at Frontier and what they're at, and, and if it is 12 to 15, yeah, that's, that's <coughs> richer, more diverse. But if it's, if it's getting too big, that's a problem. Second, um, I'm one of these piece, people that's on the elementary level, and um, looking at those numbers in the area are getting smaller and smaller. So, luckily, we're choicing in, as you said, all these 140, 120 students helping Frontier manage a, a larger population of students, which gives us a more diverse curriculum across the board, co-curriculars and, and educational curricular. If our numbers in this area are going to keep going down for elementary, does that mean we're going to need to choice in more students to manage to keep that 600, which is going to cost all the towns a lot more because we have less elementary school kids rising up to Frontier, and then we're going to have to bring in more um, choice in. And also, last, last bit, ironically, because you're offering such a great program at Frontier, all these people want a choice in, and they're getting a bargain because they're only, you know, we, we get five, there, it's a $5,000 program that we're, you know, that, that's choice in, but you're offering a much more diverse and um, extensive curriculum. So, of course, they want a choice in. And, and they don't pay anything. Right. And I don't think that we're suggesting that we don't want choice kids. It's more of a question of is there a way for us to, to look at that $5,000? Is that set by the state? Is there any thing that can be done to bridge the, the five or 12, if you, if you count in the special ed um, dollars, to make it 20. Because especially if we're looking at a third of our students being school choice students, that doesn't just mean that the towns are paying $20,000 per student. That means that the towns are paying $30,000 per each of our students, and then the choicing in students are paying five. And so, you know, is, is that, if we were a hotel and we had hotel rooms that were going unsold, it would make sense to fill them because even even five thousand dollars is more than zero. But if we're making, you know, if we're talking a third of the school, how many entire classes is that that are are only exist because of the stool choice that is costing the towns, you know, eight thousand dollars per kid? Um, and do we want to? be looking in the long term at a maintaining our size for the sake of maintaining our size at the expense of the budgets of the town or if we are looking at lowering enrollment should the district be talking about looking at a smaller frontier class size going forward and how to make that be a, a goal as opposed to the goal of just adding more school choice more school choice more school choice in order to not lose enrollment which again i get from a Darius' perspective in terms of his budget and maintaining his staff and not having layoffs and all those things, but we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're effectively selling a third of our products at under cost in order to just maintain our, our numbers. And even in the business world, that doesn't work. Um, so I really think that we need to, to have a bigger discussion about what the school choice, the future of school choice is for our district. Can we find a way either through advocacy to the state or through other programs to be able to increase that five to twelve thousand dollars depending on how you look at it um, up to be more close to the twenty thousand dollars and or can we start talking about if twenty thousand dollars per student um, can can be brought down a little bit so I did mention earlier that we are seeing a change in population students coming and that the frontier region will be reducing probably in size given the current population coming out of the towns I didn't say I'm turning it back, though, the next few years to keep us at the same size. So if you're looking at numbers with a most significant drop, I'm um, seeing the current fourth grade classes coming up. So, you know, the plan is not to continue to backfill the choices. So when we look at the middle school numbers, we look at what the current number of residents are and how many we can add um, to round out that class, given it's the staffing we have that we can add additional four sections. I mean, by core sections, this year, English or math or science or social studies. You know, so we run the same number of, we have a four different sections for it. So, you know, you're going to probably see the school have to adjust to, um, I think we've been able to stay a little bit larger than a lot of our city schools that have seen right the reduction in Franklin County in population. Um, maybe it'll change over time and we'll see a, uh, a baby boom of some sort, but I, I think in the next uh, by five to seven years, you're going to see right here probably come down um, maybe another hundred. Um, students or so. Uh, yeah, so in answering that question, uh, 
you know, school, again, I think you're going to give it, give it the debate about school choice. Um, if it, it's, uh, do we have sections of students with having a third? Well, we look at each class level, Tom, each grade level, school? how we Tom, take in school did choice. did you have a question still? So, oh, yeah. and we allow choice. <laughs> We can save a ton of money if we have a prescriptive and give students no choice. So we just use the their schedule as such. But because we have choice in different schedules, you could technically have a class that has more choice than unchoice because more kids chose, um, you know, chose an elective, you know, creative writing elective, grown, whatever. We don't track that internally. We track the overall class as a whole and base that on the core subjects coming in middle school. So how many kids are enrolled in English classes basically what we is it moving for more? Is this what we're taking every year for four years of year? So it's a, I think we're saying it's, but it's also complicated. I can make two additional comments about that. On that for school choice. So uh, for example, based on the October 1 data, we have 25 seniors who are school choice in. We probably will replace those 25 in the various grades, but we're not seeking to grow that number. 25 is a significant number of a change year to year. So if we can bring in 25 seventh graders who may actually be from our own four elementary schools, we're about even with the outgoing class as an example. So we're not, the loss that's going out of the senior class is almost equal to what's coming in year to year. That doesn't typically grow. Uh, we have some larger school choice class sizes coming up where I think we're going to have larger numbers graduating than we have coming in. Um, and that's going to be a result of what Darius is talking about with the enrollment shift and change. One of the examples is uh, Deerfield Elementary. Lauren did mention this, um, and anyone that has watched those meetings, we are talking about reducing class sections because of enrollment. And that means a reduction in staffing, which reduces our budget. But that's driven by numbers. And the impact is if we only have two sections of kindergarten, we can't take school choice in kindergarten coming in. So we are having those conversations. There will be trickle effect of the frontier over the years. And I have been talking to, and we have been talking to, um, all of the elementary school budgets, uh, school committees, and frontier about looking at class sizes to make to make sure that our budget is the right size for the students and the staffing that we have. And and I personally believe that there is going to start to be a shift at some point because our numbers are consistently dropping across the board district wide. There's going to have to be a shift. You have a question? Yeah. Is that all? Back to Sunderland in a minute. I just want to make comments on what Sutherland had said. You know, when we're talking about school choice, it's important to think about fixed costs versus variable costs. You. you know, just because, you know, we're taking the total budget and dividing by the number of students, that's not the true cost per student. It's an average. It's, it's an indicator. It's not the actual cost. So there are times where it may appear as though we're running a deficit because we have, uh, you know, only five grand coming in, but it's actually offsetting the cost. So for everyone on the call, like it's, it's not the most intuitive thing in the world, but we, we do have to think of it in, in terms of it being like a, a very specific thing year to year in, in terms of like class sizes and fixed costs to actually run the program. If we get a few extra kids in school choice, um, that, that, that could actually be a huge net increase uh, for the, the budget. So I just wanted to let everyone know that you know, it's complicated. The final part that was said was, we go to the state for more school choice. The state doesn't really care about school choice. School choice affects the area we're in now, the area we live here, and we can't cop. The rest of the state does not see the numbers of students moving from district to district. In fact, the kind of the, the suburbs of Boston and you know the, the W's and whatnot, they have very little uh, exchange of students in school choice applies. So uh, it's really a case for the special mass issue and that's not where the political power you're not gonna see a change in school choice. Yeah. 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 It's a long off the bat. I can't say that. So I'm gonna do you have another question there? Tom? Uh Darius, just a couple things. First, um do you know what school choice, how much came back to the towns after Ed reform back in like 1997 or so? 
You know what school choice was? How much, how much came back to the towns? And it's kind of a rhetorical question because it was $5,000 back then. So here we are 20 plus years later and we're still at $5,000. So I would say that the school choice was a much better deal for the towns back in the, the early to mid 1990s than it is now. I think we all can agree about that. I, I think that you, you guys have, the Frontier, Darius and your staff have tried to manage school choice um, and, and to me, I, uh, Bob Holla has been there a long time and I see Mary Raymond's name was there a couple seconds ago. She's been there a long time and a lot of other members also. Um, we've been talking about school choice for a long, long time and, and this conversation is the same. But Massachusetts is a commonwealth and definition of a commonwealth is very important. I learned that in Frontier, by the way, back in the 1975 with Mr. Heston and Mr. Barnard. And I don't see how, um, when you, you had an earlier comment about where 70% of chapter um, 70 or 71 monies are going to a very, what, 7% of the, the school districts, that's not a commonwealth. Um, that's not, that's not giving our children in, in our area, and Carolyn earlier had said this, and I agree with Carolyn a million percent, that's not giving our children the same opportunities that the children, other children are getting in other parts of the state. So I, I don't know what you and we, I don't want to say you, but I don't know what we have to say, but if there's anybody in rooms listening to this right now that is accepting with the fact that there's other children in other parts of this state, it's not a big state, um, that can get a better education than our children can, we should all be very disappointed and we should try, work together to try to make that inequality go away. Thank you, Darius. Sorry, yeah, I'm going to keep it really brief. It's not a question, it's a statement that kind of, again, I assume we want to stay on, but I'll just mention that if we're done with our comments, we can like close and start the next meeting. Which area, whatever. which area is not, that seems, um, it's, 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 it's not by happenstance, it's intentional, and it is about money and politics. So we do need to advocate for more equitable distribution and not have school choice have to weigh in so profoundly in our discussions. And I know everybody here has good intent and wants the best for our students. We need to make sure that's happening across, like you said, a commonwealth. So thanks for the opportunity to comment. I just want, I just, I just want to say something about school choice. So I'm from Waitley. Our school size is one class per grade. And, and I've been saying it for years, thank God for school choice because that helps our budget a lot way into the school choice numbers that are way If we didn't have school choice, then we, have, we would have, well, we'll pick out fifth grade. Fifth grade would maybe have eight kids in it or nine kids. So the way we thank God for school choice, and I remember probably four or five years ago when, when Frontier got hit Good hard morning. because of charter and stuff, it was like a million dollars in, but we also had to pay a million dollars out. So if we didn't have school choice, we would have to pay out a million dollars for charter, and not for private school, but for charter and school choice going out. So I like school choice. Um, Paul? Okay, just a, a follow-up. I think Tom and Carolyn, I agree 100%. I think everyone in this room does that quality of education may not be equal to here in the eastern part of the state. But unless you identify those inequalities, unless we can show the taxpayer what that inequality is over time, that it will never change. And that has to happen, and that has to start here in this school. And you have to sell this we have to sell it at meetings like this when we have the voters watching. And so 
So, and, you know, we can talk about it all day long, and it will only be talk. Unless you can show in black and white what our students are not receiving versus what others are, then it's, uh, it's a moot point. Skip. I just wanted to add a comment to what you said a moment ago. Uh, as a youngster, I thought the work in construction, we moved a lot. There was one half a year that I spent in a little town of Hartsville, Maine. I don't know if you're they're all familiar with that work. It had a great change of pain in a three room schoolhouse. I was in grade three, and in the row that I was in there, I think there was about five of us. And then there were two other rows, grade four and grade five. For me, that was one of the best experiences that I ever had in a classroom for three grades. And if you're missing out, you can do this. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make a quick differentiation between using school choice to fill up classes and having a third of uh, 600, you know, 600 kids be um, school choice. And that, at that point, we're not talking about filling up classes. We're talking about entire seg sections of classes that are school choice. Um, and that if we were to compare the budget with 600 students that we have today versus a budget that just included the students from our schools and compared the per dollar amount that we're paying per student right now versus if we had no school choice, um, I think we would find a dramatic difference. And I'm not advocating that we get real school choice. And to be clear, um, my concern here is our, our budget. I, I, I think school choice is a great thing. I think it's a, it's a great program, especially for students who, who want to be able to have an opportunity. And I'm glad that students from Greenfield and other school districts are able to come to our school to do that. Um, I just think it's important that we have a conversation and at least acknowledge that the bill for that is resting with the Denver towns. And that if what we are looking at is wanting to be able to provide an educational experience of 600 or even 800 students, that the, the, the variety of classes that it offers, I think regionalization might be the, 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 the quest, question to start asking is, rather than having Greenfield and Montague be paying us a little bit of money, do we want to talk about having to be more member towns in our district so that all the towns are paying less and it's not just all coming on the backs of the four of us? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Do you want it, want me to adjourn. You need to adjourn? Do you want me to uh, adjourn it? I think we need to adjourn this meeting and start the next one because <laughs> it's a different hybrid thing. You want to do that? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three zero two. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, all right, I'm leaving. So, so, so. I did this What what Bob 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 said about school choice was what were what what you were talking about. Because if if you have six or eight kids in a class. It would be prohibitive to pay 
for a teacher and what needs to be done for the sick. So you bring in school choice to bring it up to 13, 14, 15, and then those school choice kids go to Frontier. Now, Whiteley's no longer paying for those school choice kids. It's us. It's, it, yeah. yeah. Because their numbers are down and our, our, our percentage goes up because theirs go down. So, so there's, there's, when you can look at the percentages, it can look like they're equal, but they're not fair. We're still, are we, we're still on air? Yeah. Uh, but they're not fair. Uh -huh. That's, I think it's now. Yeah. It's not fair. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Board of Select, the Select, Sunderland Select Board. I'd like to call the order because Jeff said Recording it was, in progress. Because Jeff said it was going to be a quick no. budget hearing. <laughs> Is there such a thing? Did, didn't he tell us that last night, Crystal? He might have. What are you talking about? This was only an hour and a half. Did this was quick. Didn't he say it was going to be a quick meeting? <laughs> I think this is twice as long as last year when Frontier and the elementary school both presented. Okay. So I'd like to call the order at uh, 7.36. Huh. About an hour after Jeff said we would be here. All right, Mr. Jeff, what's up? Okay. Um, we have minutes from the last meeting and also two sets of executive session minutes um, from June 13th, 2022 and February 6th, 2023. Okay, I'll entertain a motion for minutes. Do you need each one separate? I think you can make one for all three. Okay, so I am mo I motion we approve the minutes from February 27th for the regular scheduled meeting, and then the executive session minutes from June 13th and February 26th of 2022. You have a motion made and seconded. Yep. You have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor. Flavor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. At this time, Jeff, that's a 3 0 vote. Please declare that the executive session minutes from February 6th and from June 13th uh, now can be released. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up. Next up, we have the town meeting and election dates. Um, articles are due by March 17th, so 10 days from today. Um, last day to register to vote. Uh, sorry, articles due by March 17th. Last meeting to vote for ballot questions is March 27th. Um, last day to register to vote in annual town elections and at annual town meeting is April 18th. Um, we will continue to meet with the finance committee um, until the warrant has been posted. The warrant must be signed um, sometime before April 21st. We are going to be mailing residents by um, Wednesday, April 19th with the information about town meeting. Um, the warrant for the election and town meeting will be posted by Friday, April 21st. Town meeting is scheduled for April 28th. Um, and then the date of the annual elections is May 6th. Um, the only, there was one question um, about whether we might want to consider moving up the time of annual town meeting from seven to six. Somebody asked, so I, I don't, I assume it's earlier so it's easier for some people, but there are people who work on Fridays and so six might not be convenient, so I don't, um, but somebody asked, so I passed. Six thirty. Let's consider six thirty. How's that? Because we used to have, we used to hold special town meeting before the annual town meeting, and we started them at six thirty. So we could always do. And that, we didn't really have a difference in attendance. I don't think. I, I think most people were there. But all right, we'll 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 consider that, Jeffrey. Thank you. What's up next? Can I just add? Ask one thing. It came up last night. Um, Kind of fun last night, <laughs> but uh, the crowd last night 
with all due respect, all older people mostly. Is there a way, you know, a town meeting and caucuses like that to have ways to invite and get more of the younger people in Sundown to be there? You know, and, and uh, I was talking with Amanda about it on the way out. It's also it's somewhat intimidating, even for me. I'm not that young, but the, it seems very um, top heavy. Not you guys, but just. No, we're it was nomin here. nomination. It was exciting. Like, okay, you're nom. Okay, it's close. Okay, you did close, close. It's all kind of the same people who have done it for years. But it, I mean, one of the things we've talked about before is how do we get more younger people um, involved in the town government or or interest? Um, one idea came up. It would ever be a way to to have that meeting? Or maybe it's done before. This is for the caucus at the elementary school and have. Child care provided somehow. You know, we've done that with PTO meetings. We've done that at some other events at Sunderland, um, and same thing with town meeting. I mean, that last year we had what hundred people there, probably. Mm -hmm. that, that you know, is there a way to get, encourage more of the, the people who have families who can't be there to be there? So I just want to just say in, that in the in the past, Joe, yeah. on, on for incur like the PTO was offered to have child care. So if that's something the PTO would want to do with the child care, be yeah. more than happy to to do that. I got a foot in the door there, so I'll, yeah. I'll bring that to So you. so that's a good point. Yeah. I, I, I think one thing one thing with caucus, um and, and we've struggled with because there's different ways that you that you can put people on the ballot. One way in Sunland always has, has done the caucus. But you could sometimes do do it by petition, so you can go out and get so many signatures. We typically don't do that, or we haven't done it in the past. And, and this is more in the town clerk's purview, and I hate speaking for the town clerk because she's going to tell me to get into my box. I so so uh, I, I want to I, I want to be careful because we we don't want to get in the town clerk's box. But um, the 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 town clerk does it because when you when you have it by petition when you have people sign petitions you never know until the last date the last hour last minute if you have people that are going to run so it make so having the caucus is a way for us to get people on the ballot right. so i think that's one thing um but if, if you you can talk to the we have talked we have talked in the past about changing it um, but it's always been more, it, it seems to be easier getting people, and it's funny, but I'll, we don't have a quorum for our town meeting. So we could hold a town meeting and it could be the three of us there. Mm -hmm. We do have a quorum for caucus. And so that you need at least 25 people there. So it's, it's strange, but it's good points, Joe. Okay. I think that there would be room for not just childcare, but um, I know there's a bunch of businesses in town, and you know, like in the past, we've had Bob's Barbecue has donated some food, or um, Bueno, the, the owners of Bueno have have donated food before. Um, if we made it an event and had some refreshments, some food, maybe a movie at the library for the kids or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, come do that, eat some food, socialize with your your members of the town leave the kids over there for two hours and, you know, get to be away from them for a little bit. Um, I think that would be a much more attractive event for people in town. Um, and also, just in general, we don't have a lot of town-wide festivities, and we don't have a lot of opportunities for people in town to meet. Uh, we don't have a community center. We don't have that kind of a, of a place for that to happen. So having more of that kind of thing you know, built into our schedule wouldn't be a bad idea either. So. So turn town meeting into a carnival. Exactly. Have rides, raffles, sell popcorn. It's, since my kids went left the elementary school, I haven't had a snow cone, and I need the snow cone machine back because it's not interesting. Um, but no, I, I think you make a really good point because yes, um, I for many of these caucuses, I have been the youngest person in the room. Yeah, that's when you said your age last night. That's when it hit me. It's like, yeah, he is the youngest here. I often am, um, and and it's been a, a question of mine. Is I've been trying to get peers of mine involved in politics. I want. I was hoping to, to drum up some people to come and want to run for office, and unfortunately, a lot of people in their 30s are having a hard time managing things right now, and it's right. real hard to get them involved. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would also be interested in trying to find a way to get more people younger involved. Um, yeah. 
I've al- I've always said, Joe, that the best we we have big campaigns for governor and s- s- senator and representatives and 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 early in early I remember asking an individual that I knew pretty well if they would serve on a committee and the response was well I have bigger and more important things to do and I said hmm you you when and when you're involved with the town you talk about the school budget uh, you talk about how it's spent um, right now 70% of our budget goes to school so if you're on a school committee you're on the finance committee in my opinion um, and I think you 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 can look you can look at our budget and you can you can you as a finance committee member you see where we spend every dollar um, I would happen to guess that if you took the state government budget or in Massachusetts <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't you would have no idea where the money's going and I can guarantee if you look at the federal budget so I just think that you have a, an opportunity that's why going to town meeting people don't realize you go to town meeting and you you're voting the budget you're 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 saying where we're going to spend the money you're how we're going to spend that money the select board just and the finance committee just put together numbers, but it's the people that go to that, and that's why when people say, "Well, your budget," I go, "It's not my budget. It's your budget. You're the people that vote." So, but Joe, if you can make more people come, hallelujah, brother. We need because I I think I think you should get people involved. Jeffrey, next. Um, do we want to? Talk about accounting um, this evening or finance. I mean, I, from my perspective, I've been having conversations with FERCOG and I've come to the conclusion that I, the town has outgrown the services that the FERCOG can provide. Um, you know, it's March, we don't have certified free cash. It was March last year when our free cash was certified. Has it been submitted? It's been submitted um, and returned and submitted and returned. And um, it, it j- give just, us a plan. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we will look at what options are out there. We're talking about, you know, the, the COG isn't, it seems like they are not providing the support that, that we need. Um, so we were looking at maybe hiring either a retired or a more seasoned finance or accounting person um, to help the FERCOG's accounting person out because they... And, and, and that's fine if we reduce their FERCOG's assessment to us, right? Are, is, that, is that what you're thinking? I, I mean, I, I would hope so, but... You know, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen their assessment, and they're not. I doubt they're going to do that, honestly. And I think that they won't do probably sure. our our long term plan should be to move away from from them. That's fine. Um, and sooner rather than later. So we'll look at accounting service um, firms and potentially hiring. Do, do, I, think, an do I think I can tell you guys because I won't be here next year? But if you have, if you don't, when you don't have an accountant. And the teachers aren't getting their the money goes into the right account, and people don't get paychecks. They're big troubles. Oh, I'm sure, but you know, I think Jeff is right. We we talked about this in a lot of detail last night. That this the person the FERCOG is supplying to us has questions, needs support, needs help. FERCOG can't provide that to. Her. To her, and we need these tasks done. Yeah, so absolutely. whether we have to hire a consultant, a contractor, whatever type of temporary, short term title you want to give this person, um, you know, to help get them out from you know the hole they're in, we, we've got to be able to move forward. This. Every year. I mean, what happens next year when it's April and we don't have free, you know, yeah. 
we just keep getting further and further behind. Yep. Come up with a plan. Okay. How much are you paying for accounting services now? Uh, I believe this year we were assessed about fifty five, fifty six thousand. Is that is that included? How much you're spending on getting help? Nope. Plus sixteen thousand for the software that doesn't really work that we're required to use. By Furcog or okay. By Furcog. So if we got rid of Furcog, we so you say there's a problem with the software. Yeah, our own software. Okay. Also. But might really, be better. That's software. the first I've heard that. They've been having. People have been having trouble connecting since before I got here. Um, it's it's the remote connections, and then occasionally when they're in, there's a. I, I won't pretend to understand it, but there's they call it a ghost login, and so they can't change the warrant number, so they can't actually process the bills, and then they got to call the vendor, and the vendor has to clean out all the logins, and then they can change, and it's like a, it's a weekly cash. thing. And we've talked to and our we pay, IT firm, we've talked to- $16,000 for that. We, yep, we, and we said, oh, let's move to the cloud so we don't have to worry about this. They're gonna, it's gonna cost $5,000 more per year plus a setup transfer fee. And I was like, it's going to the cloud. You have no managed cause. It's an aid, doesn't matter. It, it makes less sense to go to the cloud um, and pay more money. Have you talked to um, the, the auditors about a, a software that they would recommend? I can talk to the auditors. I mean, I know that there, the t three main things that are used are the one we're using, Vadar and uh, Munis are sort of the, the three standards. Munis, we used to have Munis, I thought. We might have. Way back. Yeah, a I mean. DOS, I, a DOS base. Yeah, I know people. A floppy disk. Munis is really a complicated system, but I know a lot of people use it. Okay. So you would be, so, so right now, we we don't really have the software. We're just, we're just paying for a license, right? Yeah, an annual. An, an annual. So the COG, ha the COG has a license, and or the COG has a software, we just have a license to that. The COG has a deal with the software company to have, to, they get a deal on several licenses for all the other towns they provide accounting for. Yes. My understanding is that we bought our own license outside of that because we had more accounts and people and a bigger budget. We're a bigger budget, right. Yeah, that, that happened a long time ago. Yeah. And because yeah, it was it, it, and the software was all based on size. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next. Next capital stabilization override. Do you want to talk about? Sure. Um, you should all have gotten a email with the recommendation. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail because it's already been a long night. Um, but pursuant to our last discussion with the Capital Planning Committee, um, surprisingly, not a lot has changed, and we still feel that a two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollar capital stabilization override um, is our best path, best path forward to be able to afford the capital requests that are coming in. Um, and the big asterisk that I want to make sure that we start with is the requests we're looking at over the next ten years are what we know today we need over the next ten years, and without fail every year when it comes to be that year there's more than there was 10 years ago when we looked at it and so these numbers are the absolute floor of what we're going to be looking at spending over the next 10 years um and the ceiling is probably double this if not more um and that's between inflation uh, a lot of the items that are on this list were quoted at being substantially less two years ago three years ago last year um and so by the time we get to some of these items they'll be more expensive and there will be items you know, who knows what's going to happen with the, the, the buildings in our town two years from now. A flood could happen, termites could be discovered, you know, things that aren't on our radar today will come on our radar. Um, and so we felt that the 250000 to 300000 um, probably isn't even enough, but it's the most we could feel like would be a reasonable ask to the town without it just being, a, a you know, 
<laughs> being a complete shot in the dark. Um, we, we are aware that there is a substantial chunk of free cash likely to be in our future, um, but especially given things like our presentation we saw tonight where Frontier alone is going to cost us $200,000 more than last year, the elementary school is going to cost us probably $100,000 more than it did last year, um, we we're looking at substantial increases across town, um, and so I would not count on that free cash being the answer to our capital problems. And if it, it becomes the answer to our capital problems, and this is something we discussed heavily, it's going to mean that we eat up all that free cash real fast, and then next year we're back to the same position where we have close to three quarters of a million dollars worth of capital requests, and we don't have a cushion to work with, um, and that's concerning to the capital planning committee. So any any questions for us from either of you? So do you have the next five, 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 six, seven years uh, what looks capital is gonna be coming up, Nathaniel? I do. And and no, just just I think that's important that we share. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be done now, but but I so that everybody has it so that we can look so it, so it's not just us telling them, but they can actually see what, what you guys are what what you've looked at, okay? Yep. No, our, so for this year, the capital requests that we have pending um, are $784,000 of capital requests. Um, this is not including anything that we consider to be fluff. This is already with us trying to narrow it down to being stuff that's, you know, things are falling apart and if we want our kids to have heat and, and air conditioning, we need to do these things. Um, so that's this year. For year 25 is a quarter of a million. For year 26 is 840. For year 27 is 158, 28 is 454, for year 29 is 300, and for year 30 is almost 700,000. Um, so the lowest year in there is the 158, um, and again, the chances of us getting to, to year 27 and having that be all on our docket is almost unheard of. Um, but even that lowest year, at our current rates of $124,000 in our capital stabilization fund, um, or our capital stabilization, whatever that allotment is, um, doesn't even cover our lowest year, let alone years that we're looking at on here that are almost a million dollars. And when we get to them, will be a million dollars worth of capital requests. Um, I think that, in general, what we're looking at this year is there is no path, at least from my perspective, to get all of the things we need to pay for this year paid for without there being some kind of override, whether that's a capital capital override, whether that's a budget override, whether that's a big debt exclusion that we ask for, or some combination of the above, um, I don't think that there's a path short of massive cuts across the board to be able to make 2.5% cover all of this. I mean, as, as I was mentioning before, they're talking about over $200,000 from Frontier and I think it's what, 195 is what we can raise? 194, 50 or something like that. Um, so it's, you know, Frontier's our entire budget for the year. If we did level, not even level services, but level spending for the rest of the town, we are already <laughs> over just from Frontier. Um, and that does not include, you know, a lot of our budget presentations. We've had departments coming in saying we need 15%, 20%. Sometimes more. I mean, some some of them have been able to keep it to no increase or that kind of thing. Um, but you know, even if we aren't able to pass this this year, we're going to be even in a worse position next year. And so, I don't have a choice. Okay. Thank you. And on that great note, just kidding. Um, but yeah, we we are uh, we feel that. A, a number between the two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand dollar mark is a mark that the town, um, given the context we can provide, could see a path towards passing. So I remember seeing that, had, and we were talking about it. I think it was two weeks ago. But um, you know, it's, you get through two hundred, three hundred this year. Next year, seven hundred. Then it goes down. Then it goes up. Then it goes down. Like how, like the eight hundred thousand dollar year, which is I think four years out. What? Are you seeing what's the big expenditure that year? So I don't have those numbers in front of me. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I didn't see. I didn't see it itemized. I just saw yeah. the numbers that you just rattled off. Um, we can. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Jeff about this, but we can. What I'm sure we can come up with. Ah, uh, there's a year. He just said it might be four years out. Uh, Fiscal year twenty six. Twenty six. Yeah, so two, two years out. I mean, this year is seven hundred eighty four already. So, so, and then that's that's part of what I, I wanted to kind of highlight here is. Yeah. 
Yes, the school roof is the, is the two year one. And I think I think there's also day. a I think that's when the load one of the um, highway vehicles comes yep. to. So I remember we talked about the school roof last year, yep. and it's only twenty years old, twenty two years old, right? No. No. Oh yeah, it, it is. is. Yeah. 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 And it should be thirty year roof, right? So why is it forty? Yeah, I mean, yeah, even more, right? So I'm wondering, like, why is it failing? Who's liable for it failing? And then if we're gonna replace it, I brought this up last year, you guys might remember. I mean, why don't we go replace it with something that's gonna improve the quality, like a solar roof? Yep. And why don't we look for grants for a school? I mean, I'm sure they're out there right now to get some solar company to come in that would do it, you know, to, you know, is it kind of a, a pilot or a, you know, not a lot of schools have solar roofs right now. Why, why not Sunderland be one that starts out on solar? I mean, how do we go about looking at things like that? And that would generate income for electricity for the school. School could possibly, with that size roof, could possibly be self-sufficient with electricity. I mean, that's something we, we discussed quite heavily. We've also discussed there's town-owned properties, including the up on 63, the, where the quarry is. Um, that the town owns that are potential sites for being able to put solar in. Right, um, and I'm talking about specifically yeah, the, oh, school, I know. And yeah, the school and the school roof. Whether yeah. we brought that up with Darius about like we'd like to know if this is a possibility for the future and make it happen. Um, and I, I personally, I'm all, all with that. I would love to see the schools not only be carbon neutral, but maybe even be dollar neutral when it comes to heating and powering the school. Right. That would be a great place. Um, the Part of the problem, and I guess part of the, the discussion is, is that if that is something we're looking at down the line, there's even more of a need to solidify a capital funding right. system so that when we get to that point and, and all of a sudden that $800,000 a year is really a $1.2 million a year because that's how much more it's gonna cost or a $4 million a year or whatever it is, um, that we have some idea of how to pay for that. Because even with grants, um, we're gonna still see costs. We're still gonna see that be you know something that we have to, have to pay for. True, and in long term though, Gonna say. Yeah, well, and and we had a, a discussion very recently about the can you, the, can you uh, send that the oil tank at the right, right, right. right, and if we'd had that conversation five years ago, we could be in a position to be putting in a green right. energy system. And so I absolutely am with you on let's have that conversation now before we are looking at twenty six and, and it out to having to replace a roof before we have that conversation. January first, so I think. Yep. With you on that. Can um, everyone in the room? help me understand. Um, what do we currently allocate for capital stabilization yearly? So the short answer is 2018, 2017, something like that, we passed $100,000 that increases by the 2.5% annually. 2014. 2014, thank you. Um, which I believe is up to 124 and change now, which, okay. so we, ha we have that. And that was, a, that was before that we had nothing. It was just good luck. Um, and that was, and I, I believe everyone here would agree, was intended to be sort of a pilot program for that. That was never intended to be, oh, this is a dollar amount that's actually going to cover it. It was like, let's see how that, what that does. And what we found what it does is it makes it a lot easier to balance the budget because we know at least where part of that money is coming from. And then rather than absorbing the $784,000 a year, at least we know we already have 124 to start with. Um, what we're looking at is adding the 250 to 300 to that, and so that every year we start off with four, okay, which is what, yeah, a right. much more reasonable number to start with, given the averages we're looking at here. So we're bumping it up to four per year. Or 375 or something along those lines. Which will yeah. increase with the two and a half. Which will continue to increase okay. with the two and a half, and we're hoping that that level may need to be increased down the line. Okay. Who knows what happens with inflation? Who knows what happens in the town? But we're hoping that level is sufficient enough that it's not. I mean. Without that, we're going to be going four of the next eight years and asking yeah. for overrides so for specific we're projects. Looking at giving ourselves about three hundred seventy-five that will increase over time. Yep. All right. So what I I, I like numbers. Yep. I numbers like are how, great. I like how numbers add up. Um, so when you told me a seven hundred and eighty-five thousand dollar year, I'm like, how does how does two hundred fifty get me there? But it's two hundred fifty on top of the existing. Yeah, and, and so. It, we're still looking at what we're asking for is half of what we need this year, and we can make the other half work. We have grants, we have other things we can do. Um, we do have free cash. Um, it's just we can't make eight hundred thousand dollars work without without some money there. Um, and I think also, in terms of transparency and honesty with the town, 
we're not being honest with the town right now about what our needs are. We are we're giving a, a false sense of security that we only need this little bit of money when in reality we need a lot more. And I think that it, it's better to ask once to, to, to make it be more in line with reality than have to ask every single year, like, yep, we're here again because you still only give us $100,000 and we need eight. Right, and I think what would obviously help the town, which I think obviously helps all of us too, is, you know, you've got these projected numbers for the next few years, but to put the big ticket items in there, yep. you know, so that, you know, my mom reading this yep. can say, oh, well, yep, yes. 800000 for a roof, I get it. Yep. To know that it's been nine years since we've asked for an increase, you know, I think that's all great information to make sure, you know, and not just the people who happen to be watching tonight and sitting here in the room and, you know, the big population in town, you know, the population needs to understand this. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why we feel that a capital override is one of the right ways to go about this. No, because I if you go agree. and ask, we need this much more money because of the general operating budget, they say, okay, well, what's that buying us? Nothing. You're getting exactly what you got last year, and it's just costing us much more, versus, well, you like ambulances, right? You like fire trucks, right? You like the school not leaking, right? Well, these are all things, very tangible things that we can present to the, to the public. So I, I, that's one yeah. of the, the main yeah. reasons why we're pushing that direction. And, and um, somebody on the, on the school committee made, um, made a really great point. It was interesting how it was communicated, but when you just talk numbers, especially just increasing operating budgets, that's really hard to swallow. But when I can specifically point to assets that we are purchasing, right. that's a lot easier for the town to digest. Absolutely. Yes. Um, but we have to be really good at communicating that. And the vice versa is also the true, which is it, when presented with, if you don't pass this, then we can't buy that new ambulance we need. We can't buy that new thing that you would really like to have if you have an emergency. That's a much more powerful thing than just like, you know, we're going to have to lay a couple people off and move, move some kids around in schools or something like that and, and do something that, to, especially to a bunch of the population in town that don't have children in the school system, just like, well, what do I care? Who, great, do what you got to do, but don't make my raise, my taxes go up. I really feel that, yeah, the, the yeah. having the capital things to point at, um, and also, we live in a time of incredibly high inflation, and so it's not going to be a hard stretch for people to understand that the, the fire, the, the ambulance went from two fifty to three seventy five in two years. That's something you know. Eggs went from two dollars a dozen you know four years ago to seven dollars a dozen today. People are going to be able to understand that in a way that you'll have a harder time convincing people that oh, it's because we want to give salary increases to people or something that you know is less tangible to them. So the follow-up question is, how do we communicate that? What's our plan to communicate that? If I had it, no. <laughs> um, so the short answer is, um, it's been my experience, because I've been in town for almost 20 years now, and I've been involved with quite a few overrides and things like that, that if an override is going to happen, it lives or dies on whether or not there are people willing to put some effort into that. You don't just throw an override out there, and then magically people show up to vote for it. Um, you're going to end up having, pick a number, 100 people who are going to show up to the polls anyways. We're going to see that and say, hell no, I'm voting against it. So if you want to override the pass, it's does the people in this room and or other people who are concerned have the time to get 100 people together to come show up and vote against it or vote for it? Um, and I think that that's going to be the big question. And as much as I don't love knocking doors in the summer, um, I'm happy to, to do that. I, I would hope that um, other concerned people in town would also be happy to, to organize that. Um, and I think one of the other advantages of having it be a capital override is that's not just school, that's not just fire department, that's not just one department, that's people who have an interest in the school, people who have an interest in public safety, people who have an interest in all these different departments in town, people who have an interest in the library. It gets all of them behind it versus asking for a specific override for the school where... And you know what, here's your carnival event. Yes. Here I'm is just, your popcorn and your come down and we'll tell you and we'll show you we'll meet out front here of the town hall and you can see the steps and you tell so, me those don't so. need to be replaced and let's have the food truck and things like that that's your event well, and, one, and, and i could I, and i could i i'm disagree with what nathaniel's saying a little bit because earlier we said frontier <coughs> 
and school education is about 70% of the budget. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if if you want if you want to if you want to pay for a good education, the town demonstrated over the years that that it 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 values and knows the 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 strength of having a good education, right? Well, guess what? We we can't continue to pay for education 70-75% of our budget and neglect the other portions of our of our budget. town. And, and 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 in in fact, it, it, there's an interest there was a very interesting and and, and I guess I, I really wanted to say this tonight also, but I couldn't say it before, but I think now is an appropriate time. There was a very interesting article about Lynn Sibley retiring in the town of Whateley. Lynn, Lynn's a, a wonderful person. I've known her and her family for many, many years. But that's not what I took took out of the retirement notice in the paper. What I took out of the retirement notice is that Whiteley, which is a lot smaller than Sunderland, has a totally different... So we have many... We have Sunderland has a very mobile population. We get people in and out. Town clerk to town clerk the treasure collector, th there's a lot of work that they do because people are moving in and out of the community, right? In a, in a smaller town of Whiteley that has way less than we do, they have an assistant, they have a full-time treasure collector, they have an assistant treasurer collector, they have a town clerk, assistant town clerk, and an assistant town manager or town administrator. That's in Whiteley. Sunderland, has a collector treasurer, we have a town clerk, we have a, an assistant town clerk, but the assistant town clerk comes in when the town clerk's not here because she's on vacation. Heaven forbid she takes a vacation because that's when our About assistant town- 20 hours a year versus 20 hours a week. And, and, and so I, I can, I'll just tell the people of Sunderland that if you want to look at efficiency, in, in, in the breadth of in, in, of hard work, come to our town hall, because there and, and you can go to Deerfield, Deerfield's larger, and you can look at their staffing. You can go to Hadley, which is not a lot bigger than Sunderland population wise. Look at their staffing, and then come back and see what we have for staffing in our town. So I, what I'm, I agree with Nathaniel. And Crystal, what they're saying about the need of an override for, but my reason is, is that by having that override, you're actually supporting education, because you're allowing our town, you're, not to fight over spending that money, on education, but we're doing it on necessary things that we need to keep our town running, in my opinion. Sorry, Nathaniel. No, totally. So I had a thought. Um, in terms of you had a very quick question on how to get this out. Um, the Capital Planning Committee has actually talked about doing something we haven't done recently but used to do, which is taking a tour <coughs> of the facilities in town, going to the safety complex, going to the library, doing a little tour. Um, what if we recorded that? What if we what if we took a had you know, someone from FCAT come over with a camera and each each you know, administrator of the building who's giving us a little tour shows us what needs to be replaced, which was half of the point of it anyways, and then we have a little video that we can put on social media or even play at the beginning of town meeting if we want to and be able to say, look, look at our beautiful town and all of our beautiful buildings and this is why we need to do the work is because you see that carpet there that needs to be replaced and you see that floor that needs to be replaced and you see this that needs to be replaced and oh wow, look at that. You know, we go to the, the, the South County EMS and look at their 17-year-old ambulance. You know, that's something that we could do that would get a little bit more information out and also, you know, sort of shine a good light on what we're trying to do. So I will discuss that with Jeff um, and see if that's something that we can even do. And I think you're going to want a follow-up video when it's all done to, mm -hmm. to show people where the money actually went. Well, and, that's a, and that's a good point also is that a lot of town budget stuff is get to that finish line and then, all right, everyone go home for the summer. Um, and not that I'm trying to say that we should all spend a whole bunch of time in the summer working on this, but just there is value in that follow-up of 
the following town meeting or the following caucus or the following whatever event we're talking about or even um, open house at the school, having a, 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 a part of that be, you know, let's all appreciate this new oil tank at the school or this new, you know, air conditioning system in the library of the school or whatever it is that we're talking about. Yeah, Look at that, the grass came in on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the ground. Um, yeah, I but think, yeah. I think you want a list of Accomplished like the last five years of right. capital expenditures. Just people say, "Oh yeah, my money." You know that that override, the last override. Just said, "This is where it went," and you know we're going to need to do it again. And this is what will come. But, uh, you want to know what you're paying for? You yeah. see it. You know. so that, that's all for me. Did you have anything you wanted to add since you're you're here? No, I think you're saying it right. Well, I think there's just a you know there's a need and the stuff is stuff that. It's real stuff you can see and you can point to and so on, and I think that's that generally makes it easier for people to get their head around doing it, get you know, get to being able to say yes, I can support that. But obviously, Joe's got some good points about the nitty gritty work of getting out and actually communicating that to people, and that's you know, that's how you get the success of the ballot. Well, it's hard to, because like, they did new carpet in the library, right? Last year yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The library is a building that's open to the public and anyone could go in there and go, oh, that's where the new carpet went in. Yeah. Nobody really goes into the highway department. Mm -hmm. right. In the public safety complex, you might go to the front window at the, but you don't go through the whole building. Nobody's gone into that garage. Yeah, you know, the members of the public don't really go into that garage and see, you know, they need an exhaust system or they need this or they need that. So I think having some open houses and stuff for people to actually, you know, go into these buildings that they don't typically go into. I mean, I went to the highway department and I was kind of going like, how do I find George? Um, you know, because it's just not a bill. I've lived in town, you know, my entire life. And I think that was probably only the second time in my life I've ever been over to the highway department building. So I think giving the public an opportunity to, you know, be part of that tour if they want to mm -hmm. is, you know, you may not get a lot of people that want to come and see it, but you, you might get some that want to. And those will be the younger people. You're not going to get, you know, the 84-year-old woman. You know, my mother's not going to come down and take that tour of those buildings because... No, but you make a great point. You have a touch of truck day, mm -hmm. and you bring out a lot of young people in the community. Right. Yeah. Bringing their kids over. And, you know, kind of two birds with one stone, right? So yeah. buy into, that's where my capital dollars went. It also establishes pride in our community. And I think Tom made a really great point. We have a very <coughs> transient community. And then we also have people that have lived here a really long time. And you know, Joe and I talk about this a lot. How do we bridge those two communities? Because we represent both of those communities and making decisions for the people who were here for a few years and the people who are really here lived here their whole lives too. And you have to take care of both sides of that. Yeah. And, and not that I have any idea of how to do this, but I, I think it's also would be good for the, us as a town to start talking about how to include college students more. Because not just young people in terms of young families and that kind of thing, but also we have a lot of college students who live in town and who are only going to be here for one to four years or something like that. Um, and most of them probably don't vote a single time in that one to four years they're here and or even are aware of who their select board members are or of anything going on in town because for them it's just a place that they live while they're driving into Amherst to go to school. Can we talk about how to engage them more in town, how to, how to get that to be, you know, I think it was a couple of years ago a UMass student ran for um, school committee or something like that in, in Amherst because they were, they were like, this is my town and I care about it. How do we get that vibe here? How do we get somebody, how do we get a 19 year old kid who wants to run for you know, planning committee or for select board in Sunderland? Um, and if we do, do they stay in Sunderland after they graduate and bring new blood into the town and that kind of thing? So.
I think it's hard. I mean, you don't even see the college kids that often. And they're a lot, you're right, they're a lot. You only see them when they're speeding by you. Like, if I'm walking down the street, well, there goes a college kid. You know, we live near a bunch of them and all that, you know. That, hey, you bump into them at 7-Eleven, maybe. Sometimes they are, like, sometimes Dunkin' Donuts. But not trying to get your pizza and it's yeah. like... But not a lot, you know. Yeah. You know, I see more you know, townspeople, but yeah. you're right, maybe somehow. Uh, they're probably not rude. I see them a lot, actually. You do? Yeah, because yeah, you teach them. <laughs> yeah, and you avoid them, and you still see them a lot. Um, so. They're probably not registered to vote here. Right. They're probably absentee voters back home, yeah. and that's okay, too. Um. <laughs> what else you got, Jeffrey? Um, if it's all right, I just have two things to say on the, on the capital stabilization before we move on. Um, one is, you'll notice in the memo, there's only um, about $20,000 for the elementary school. And that's because we've appropriated $300,000, $400,000 of ARPA funds. And so we've taken, so, so while this even 800000 seems like a lot, We've already moved, removed stuff from this list, so I want to make that point. Right. The other point is that um, while we're starting the discussion tonight, we need to decide on an override um, it, within the next two meetings, if that's what, what we're going to be doing to put it on the ballot and to put a Warren article together. So, um, Or the town clerk will get mad at you. Or the town clerk will get mad at me. And we damn come over well, that. We just read back. those dates right before oh, this. So. Keep coming back. So yeah. I just wanted to put that, don't have to make a decision tonight, but it's not, it's up within the next two minutes. Crystal and Tom, do you guys feel com comfortable committing to a vote next week? If we put that on the calendar for next week, voting for on this, does that enough you time for you guys to think about it? We do, but we don't have, <laughs> where are we with a quorum, where are we with Valerie? Like, where are we with our... So right now we have three people on finance committee. One is Linda, who's battling her own things, mm -hmm. but she's not coming to the meetings. And I asked Jeff, you know, is there possible to put her on medical leave? I don't know. Um, and then we have Valerie uh, Voorhees, who we can't fold in without Linda, right? Yeah. So <laughs> there needs to be a unanimous vote of the finance committee to appoint. So. I was going to bring this up later, but oh, sorry. no, 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 it, for a different reason. Yeah. Um, originally, Valerie Voorhees, um, who teaches at UMass in, in some business, economic, finance area, uh, wanted to be on the personnel committee. And so I recruited her for the finance committee thinking they have an appointment to personnel. Yeah. Um, Bird in the bush, bird in the hand, whatever. Um, and then unfortunately we found out they need a unanimous vote and you can't get a unanimous, like you can't just have a quorum and one of the people is missing. So, so with medical, and I, I maybe this is a long shot, is there some thing as an absentee vote? Because it's a medical problem? I mean, we could, they could, do a remote meeting or a hybrid if she's able to, but I don't know what her... There, there's something that requires a unanimous vote? Yes. Really? Yes. To, to allow an elected... Because uh, she's, she's an elected library, yeah. board of library trustee, so to join the finance committee, they need to say, yeah, we know that she's a library trustee and we're okay with that, all of us. But I guess That's part, what, part of the question is, does... She, the woman who's currently not able to show up, does she want to continue to be on the finance committee? Does anybody know this? Because if she's like, no, this is just, I can't do this, can she step down? If she does, does that make? We haven't been able to get in touch with her. Okay, that would, oh, that okay. would answer my, so my that, next question, which is, can we get her on for five minutes to, to vote on one thing? But if you can't get a hold of her, that's a whole different thing. That's, yeah. that's um, the reason why. Okay. In the interim, uh, and this came out late last week, so it wasn't on the agenda, um, would the select board be interested in appointing Val Voorhees to the personnel committee, not as a finance committee member? Uh, she wants to be appointed, and I've checked with the chair of the personnel committee, and he has no objections. So at least get her on that. Entertain a motion. I motion that um, Val Voorhees be appointed to the personnel committee. Seconded. We have a motion made and seconded for appointment and the for the uh, personnel committee. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Thank you. How's that, Jeff? Excellent. Oh, I can't we do that. that was <laughs> I, 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 I still think that's an amazing. Can you wave your wand for the finance uh, committee too? <laughs> I, I just, I just think it's amazing. I, there's so few things that require a unanimous vote. Right. And right. they, they I mean, took a vote with two of them, and they said, "Hey, this." Let me see. The, the death penalty is one. Um, <laughs> geez, I so if she had a been, if she wasn't a library trustee. It could just be a majority vote. It would be a yeah. moderator appointment. It yeah. wouldn't oh, even okay. be a vote. Right. Yep. Can she drop off the library trustee on this committee and then be reassigned to the library committee? Reelected. Re elected. Oh, it's elected yeah. and then yeah. reelected. Yeah. And and the select board can't can't appoint. Jeff, you, you have anything else? Moderator yeah. appointment. Um, we got a estimate to survey Plumtree Road um, about $3,000 to go from 116 to South Plain Road and that would be um, to sort of figure out how much area we might have for a sidewalk. I am so bad with North Plain and South Plain. Which is which? What's that? I am so bad with North Plain. North Plain is South first. North Plain is go by the line is property. South Plain is uh, Wild West. South Plain is Wild West. Yeah, yeah. South Plain is Wild West. Will you call it Wild West in the future? Then I'll know which <laughs> road you're talking about. If you explain to me why it's called Wild West, I have no idea. <laughs> it's just that's what it's been called since I was a kid. Do you need a, a vote on this, or just bring it to our attention? Um, if you want to, you can. There's also, I just, I don't expect a vote on this, but I wanted to bring up that the school has gotten a proposal to engineer the oil tank uh, replacement project, um, and they are seeking thirty thousand dollars to do that engineering work. So, in addition to the money we've already used? In addition okay. to the 195000 yes. Okay. So, I, I don't mean to sound like, but I'm going to say it. Is this going to be the last no. surprise, multiple thousand dollar? So the, the, they, is that the original money? Did, did, does that include money to put it in the first, on the tank? <laughs> The, see, that, see, that's why it's not the end of it. Well, no, I, I'm just, you know, we did the 195, which it, crystal. it sounded and like a big oh, chunk. Have you, have you talked about taking the old tank out yet? Oh, it's included Store. in that. That's so, gonna, that, again, that's going to cost money. I don't know all these things. What I want to know is. <laughs> You're not has, the only one. Right, but <laughs> has someone stepped back and said, oh, wow, this. $30,000 engineering fee kind of caught us by surprise. Has someone looked at what other surprises there might be? So I, I would say that this is not, the, the cost is a surprise, but the fact that there was a, an engineering cost was not, because originally they came and they, I think they wanted 20,000 or 25,000 to do the engineering. And we said, here's 10000 Why don't you tell us what it's actually going to cost? So at least I was aware that they were going to come back and say, hey, we need money for engineering. Wow. I, I, guess I guess I assumed it was part of the 195 Right. So that's what I, you know, I would have assumed that that 195 covered everything, you know. Or at least was their best guess at covering everything. They're coming back to us saying, well, act, we should be budgeted 20 and 30, so maybe 10, 10, 10 more. But them coming back with the whole 30 kind so, of feels like, why, why didn't you ask for something originally? So the tank the tank going to take a year to build, right? So that's the other thing. The other potential cost difference is ordering a steel tank. We could, I think the time frame for a steel tank is about 16 weeks versus 60 weeks for a fiberglass tank. Okay, I thought we settled on a fiberglass tank because it wasn't going to rot. So, there was, I, I don't recall a discussion about fiberglass, but. I thought that was being, that was, was what, I, didn't one of you ask about that? I think we talked about that in one of the early discussions. But I guess the, the question is, there seems to be appetite in town for this to be the last time we put in a fossil fuel related thing into the school and that are, are the hope, at least amongst the people that I've talked to in the various committees and whatnot that we've done, is that 
we start talking about how do we get the school onto heat pumps or you know, heat pumps and solar or some other green technology, are we caring as much as we might 20 years ago about whether this tank is going to be a 30-year tank or not when hopefully in 15, 20 years it's obsolete and we're not using it at all? And if that's and do we know what the difference in cost is for the the steel to the fiberglass? Yeah, it's about twenty thousand dollars. I'm sorry, twenty two thousand dollars. And what the engineers from Tie and Bond said is that the steel tanks have um, a fiberglass coating and are essentially the same. And and what we heard from our uh, fire inspector was that when they pull tanks out of the ground. There's something in the soil in Sunderland <laughs> that actually keeps them pretty um, intact. And he said they pulled out 20-year-old ones with stickers still on them. <laughs> so so I, I would say that we, we gave them $10,000 that before I, before I would release any additional monies, I would, would think that we would have somebody tell us what the total project is going to cost because they, I thought we had some upfront money. So, so does that make sense? I mean, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't I thought that's why we originally gave it $10,000 so we would understand what it was going to cost. Was that out of ARPA? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was actually the first thing that we approved ARPA wise so, for this. We did so I, I'm looking at the ARPA list. We did a oil tank monitor for 9,000. Yeah. We did an above ground oil tank study which was 5600 and I don't see anything that that, that was this it w w you gave up to 10,000 5600 was what it cost but that was for the monitor that was for the oh, above ground oh, no, oil, the tank. oil tank study okay so and that's what it went was from above ground to in ground was also because when they did the study, they said, if you go above ground, the whole school is set up now for this tank in this location underground. If you move it to an above ground tank, you have to put in the cement pad. It still has to be able to capture the oil spill and you have to buy equipment and additional labor to hook up the now above ground tank to the school. Yeah, and you have and an so above ground tank expensive. in right. part of the school where students, I mean, but that, that school, there's very little part of the school where students don't go around outside and you're, you know, having a tank there. Um, so just to, just to clarify, they've spent 56, 25 already of the 10,000 that we set aside for them to get the study done. Now they're asking for 30 in addition to that. So they still have 43, 75, 4,375 of the original 10, so they basically need another 26 ish thousand dollars to be able to well, do it. Right, but it's already subtracted out the 5625, so we just give, you know, so the study is different than the engineering. I just it, meant that it's not it, 30 plus 10, it's 30 plus 5, 6. It, I, no, again, it's, it's, well, yes. I, I, yes again, right. I would recommend that we, that no additional monies are are voted until we know what the total project is going to cost. I think that's fair. And if they don't, they don't got enough money. They said they need five thousand dollars more. I'll give. I, I would say go ahead, give the five thousand dollars if you need to continue study. But we're going to get in. And I'm not saying it doesn't have to be done. But at some point, we need to know what the total cost is because all of a sudden it may be something that we want to bond. If 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 it or. I agree with Nathaniel. You may not want to go. They, the only reason we're doing it is because you're you're you just bought new boilers, right? You just replaced. You just put new boilers. Uh, okay. I was just at a conference in Texas. Guess what we talked about? Decarbonization of industrial or uh, uh, district energy systems. Okay. So I learned about many nuclear power plants. I learned about. Uh, uh, take in solar and use it to uh, electrolysis to break up into hydrogen so that you can burn hydrogen and make in small mini grids. There's all kinds of things out there uh, that are very uh, uh, using sewer to power communities, the, the waste heat out of sewers. So that's, that's, those are options. And, mm -hmm. and I wish that we would 
the the whole thing. Well, we already committed because we bought a boiler. Never made sense to me, but well, and that's always going to be the case because we're always going to have unless nothing nothing fails for ten years straight. We're always going to have something that we bought two years ago that we're like, well, we can't switch now because we just got an oil tank. Well, we can't switch now because we just got this. We can't switch now because we just got that. At some point, you got to pull the bandaid. So I agree. So so I would say that until we know what it's going, they could come in and say it's going to cost. It's going to cost. Five hundred thousand dollars to get uh, to install to to do the, the there's a leak and you have to do a contamin you know you have contamination in the well, soil. Well, the contamination part we're not going to know until they start the work, no, right? You, no, you can know now. I mean, you, you can, can take you can take you can take stuff. samples now. But yeah, but I, I just I just think that you need to under we need to understand how much it's going to cost before we exhaust the entire ARPA because you're just throwing money down a black hole right now. In my opinion, and, and actually, I don't see the the thirty thousand on the the agenda, so you can't vote out in any ways. Yeah, no, it, I was bringing it up. Why did you bring it up to for bring tonight? It up. To bring it up, so you have time to think, think about, about it. Oh, he wanted to, he Not wanted to do around. a new Jeff uh, Kravitz uh, time three hour meeting, huh? <laughs> he wanted to keep you up tonight. Yep, he hasn't done one of those. We've been here later, but yeah, talking about a dog. Yeah. All right. Anything else? That's not on the agenda that you want to talk about? Uh, did you want to vote on the survey of plum tree? Yes. Okay. Motion. I motion we appropriate $3,000 from ARPA to survey plum tree road from 116 to South Plain. Seconded. North, North Plain or South Plain? South Plain. South Plain. Okay. Also Pico known as Shattuck Plain. Road. Yeah. <laughs> Also known as. Do you have a second? Second. I motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Three zero, Jeff. Anything else? The last thing, if you'll indulge me, is it's my son's birthday. Since I was totally wrong about the timing, I missed it. So I'll just wish him a happy birthday on TV. Happy buddy. birthday! Happy birthday! Yay. Sorry, Thank sorry. Take it no, down. no. I I'll I scheduled it. I know you <laughs> scheduled it. <laughs> my own fault. All right. That's all I got. Without hearing anything else, uh, motion. I make a motion. We adjourn. Seconded. We have a motion made, aye. seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero. Thank you.